One day we're going to be free from the very presence of sin. Hallelujah. We've been freed from the punishment of sin. And my chains are gone. They are gone. Today I am believing beyond a shadow of a doubt that your chains are going to be gone in Jesus' name.
people, Lord God. God, Daniel said, forgive us. Forgive us, oh God. God, forgive us as a nation. God, for going through the motions, Lord God. God, let us not be a stagnant people, Lord God. God, but let us be a people full of power, full of your fire, full of your word, full of your truth, oh God. God, open our understanding and lay in our eyes, God, that we would see souls, that we would see what this is really about, oh God. God, you have your way. Lead us and guide us in your word this morning. God, push back the enemy and the gates of hell that would come to bring a distraction. God, and let your word go forth and dwell richly and bring change. God, in everyone's heart, Lord, including me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. 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 Defeat is not your final destination. The book of Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today you shall see them again no more forever. Hallelujah. The Lord shall fight for you. Mm -hmm. You shall hold your peace. Hallelujah. In the book of Exodus, Moses was the one who wrote this book. He was an eyewitness of the miracles that God had shown his people. See, it took God's people, so to say, having their back up against the wall for God to reveal his power over and over and over again. This book was written in the midst of their journey through the wilderness. And right now I feel like that's kind of the time and season in which we're in. We're in a wilderness season where they were wandering there for 40 years. See, God's people weren't meant to stay in the wilderness that long. But because of doubt and unbelief in their hearts, they had some lessons that they needed to learn. And God still deals with his people the same way that he did then. He still deals with, with us now. And that's his grace. That's his grace and his mercy that he would allow us to face some things, to teach us some things. Amen. Amen. The circumstances surrounding this book and Moses at the time was God's saving act of Israel and that he was making a covenant with his people. God is not a dead God. He is still a saving God and he's still in the act of saving today. But I want to encourage you that his act of saving isn't just for salvation, but it's also an everyday experience. God saves us from circumstances. God saves us from ourselves. God saves us from our own stinking thinking. God saves us from religion and brings us into relationship. God saves us from temptation. God saves us from our own emotions overwhelming us and our anxieties and depression and oppression that want to come set in even during this time. Amen. I know that when um, this season came in, came in the past, and I was sitting in my house because, I mean, I lost my job. And I was like, God, what am I going to do? And the immediate reaction in the natural was fear. Mm -hmm. Fear wanted to set in and paralyze me because fear will be, bring us into a paralytic state. Yes. That meaning that we wouldn't believe God. See, God is the God who still sees today. He sees the circumstance that we're in. He doesn't slumber. He doesn't sleep. He's not up there going, oh, well, what about my people? No, God is orchestrating circumstances to get his people to believe. I feel like, and I believe this, as I'm watching all these churches,
churches on live stream reaching all these different places that they have never reached before. We're coming and encounter, even as I shared with the youth, encountering people that if it wasn't for the circumstance that we wouldn't have met these people before. God is allowing the de denominational barriers even to come down. I'm seeing different churches join together just to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. And I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God, that there's a reason to the circumstance, just like there was a reason for the children of Israel to be delivered from bondage, but he didn't bring them straight into the promised land. He brought them through the wilderness. He brought them to the Red Sea. He brought them through different circumstances. Yes. And this book was written to the Hebrew slaves who had been delivered. And I can look at that and say, that's me. Yes. I was once in chains. But now God's grace has delivered me. And not only does he want to deliver his people, but he wants to set apart his people. Yes. He's not just in the saving business. He's in the changing yes. business. Yes. Yes. And he makes all things New. The main purpose of this book was that God was establishing his nation. God is establishing his people right now. Rooted and grounded in the word of God. I'm believing that God is giving his people some roots right now. Yeah. See, because we're going to have to dig deep in the word of God. We're going to have to dig deep in our faith. We are in a place of being refined through the fire. That our faith would be seen as true. Yes. This was necessary for his people. And I believe that. I believe that what we're facing right now right. is necessary yes. for yes. his people. But not only was it necessary for his people, but he also was confirming who he was to his people during this time. And I don't know about you, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Yes. I have never seen his seed begging for bread. Hallelujah. Now he might come at the time we think we need him to come but he is an on time God and he has always been faithful time and time and time and time again if you look at your life if you look back at your life as a believer there is not one time that God hasn't come through he is an on time God and the main theme of this book was there was a depression upon the people, but God set them to be delivered from it. He's still in the redemptive act today. Yes. He's still redeeming his people. See, and I believe even during this time that there can be an onset of a depression setting in upon God's people. But he's still redeeming by the way of the blood. He's still setting free by the way of the blood. He's still providing by the way of the blood. We have to access what he has given us. See, it's already been provided on Calvary, but sometimes we just sit back and we don't access that which has been given to us and we access it through faith. Yes. Faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I know there's a simplicity to that, but sometimes when we're being squeezed, we lose sight right. of the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. That he's provided healing. See, I was looking, I was scrolling through Facebook, and I see people at, at um, hospitals praying over the night. You wouldn't have seen people being prayed for at the hospital in groups by the thousands if it wasn't for what's going on now. You wouldn't have seen people having outside church services and worshiping together. If it, see, God's people, what I love, that the enemy had come to depress God's people, but right. God's people are still rising up. God's people are still getting up. Amen. Amen. And I wanted to, I got a text message um, by Miss Vicki Seal. And she sent me this, and I thought that it was quite interesting, and I wanted to share it. 
It says that the word quarantine means 40 in Latin. And if you look in the Bible, the flood lasted for 40 days. 40 years, Moses fled Egypt. 40 days, Moses stayed on Mount Sinai to receive the commandments. Exodus lasted 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus fasted 40 days. For, it takes 40 days for a woman to rest after giving birth. 40 days is a probationary period. Quarantine in Latin means 40. God has put us in a place where he is refining his people right, right. so that we would trust him. Nothing is wasted during this refiner's time. Yeah. I believe that this is a probationary period for God's people. A group of theologians says that 40 represents change. In this time, God is allowing his people to be molded and shaped into his image. God is changing his people. He's changing the mindset of his people. He's changing a place where maybe we got comfortable in our groups. We got comfortable in our churches. We could have gotten mundane. We have got stagnant. And he's shaking his people so that there would be a change in the body of Christ. And that we would press into him. It says that during quarantine, and I thought this was pretty cool, rivers are being cleansed. Vegetation is growing. The air is becoming cleaner because there's less population. There's less theft. There's less, less murder. Healing is happening. People are turning to Christ. Finally, again, we have families at the altar together. We have families praying together. We have families eating together. We have people that are coming together. Christ promises that he works everything to the to good, together for the good, for those who love God. If you look at the year 2020, 20 plus 20 equals 40. This is 2020 is the year of the United States census and Jesus Christ was born during the census. 2020 is also perfect vision. And this is the last thing that was put there. I thought this was pretty cool. 2020 means perfect vision. May our sight and focus on the Lord and living according to his perfect vision for us, knowing he holds us in the palm of his hand. Yes. Jesus Christ is perfection. Amen. Our eyes should be set upon him during this time. And when our eyes are upon him, we were in prayer this morning and we were praying, God, give us eyes to see. Enlighten our understanding. Give us wisdom beyond our years. Help us to see in the spirit rather than see in the natural. Because when you are a born again believer, you are born by the power of God. You are born by a divine nature. God can give you eyes to see beyond the natural means. Yes. And I'm believing that he's given us a vision for this time. He's yes. given us would set our focus back on him. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. So what I've come to talk to you about is God wants to take what looks like defeat looks like defeat yeah. and turn it around yeah. for his glory that defeat is not your final destination and god will always have the last word hallelujah exodus means to exit god takes his people and he takes them on a journey and their final destination, our final destination, Pastor Matt, I love that he said it because it had it, I had it in my notes this morning, is that this earth is not our home. Yeah. In the ministry that I was in, Mrs. G used to say all the time, she used to say, this earth is not your home. Yeah. This earth is not your home. We're just pilgrims passing through. Right. Right. And the closer we yeah. get to the Lord, I mean, I wake up and I know it could be selfish sometimes, but I'm like, Lord. Just take me. I'm ready to go. And I know that we have work to do upon this earth. But this earth is not my home. No, I'm just like, Lord, take me away. Take me away. But we've got people that we want to 
Sea going with us into the promised land, going with us into glory. But I want to say this, that God has promises and land to give you now while you're on earth as you were in heaven. See, God wants you to live in Christ Jesus, and he is going to make his promises real throughout your journey in life with him. See, there's a promised land here on earth that he wants to, us to travel in as well. But this journey, this, this place of earth is always going to have obstacles. We're always going to have opposition. We're always going to have an adversary. Yes. And the adversary, the enemy, yes, there is a real enemy. Yes. And the enemy of this world will also play off the enemy of your soul. Let me say that again. The enemy of this world will also play off the enemy of your soul and will cause your mind to be doing backflips. And he is a master of isolation. So during this time, many of us have felt isolated. Many of us have felt alone, and it doesn't even have to be during this time because I was feeling alone before the quarantine. So, but he is a master of isolation. And sometimes we can be like, I'm the only one facing this. I'm the only one struggling with this. I'm the only one going through this. I'm the only one he hasn't answered this prayer for yet. I'm the only one. The enemy will always make you it look like you are the only one. So I want to expose the enemy this morning if you would give me the liberty to. And... I have some scripture. You don't have to follow along because it's a mouthful and it's a lot. But I want you to listen to the names of Satan. And this is who his character is. And then it, we're going to bring the truth to the lie. Yeah. And we're going to expose the lie of the enemy. Satan is the father of lies. And the truth is not in him. In John 8, 44, and I'm not going to read the whole verse, but it says, He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because therefore is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. See, the truth is not in him. And I was thinking about that word murderer, which means to cut off, to annihilate. And the enemy is a master at bringing lies into our hearts and into our minds that will call, cause us to murder or cut off our relationship with Christ. Because he knows that when we plug in to the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we plug in to, by faith, that there's a power that comes along with that and that his lies will be exposed. Well, in Revelation 9, 11, and I don't really know how to pronounce this, so to say, but it's Abaddon. 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 Yes. Say that. <laughs> Abaddon. Hebrew name for Satan meaning destruction. The enemy always wants to cause destruction in our lives. Yeah. Anything to get us to doubt Christ. Right. Anything to get us to doubt his character and what his word says is true. The enemy is also an accuser. Revelation 12:10 says then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of Christ has come. For the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. I want to say this. The enemy is an accuser of the brethren. Have you ever been in church before or really anywhere before and all of a sudden somebody's talking on the other side of the room and the enemy will come in and tell you that they're talking about you? <laughs> or that he can just set up a situation that makes it look like a certain way and it's not? And it says that the adversary goes before the Father and that he constantly accuses us of things we have done. Well, that's what comes to our minds too. 
A struggle that we might have is constantly being accused. We're constantly being accused that we're going to struggle with that again, that we're still the same person. We're constantly being accused, but it says that the enemy has been cast down. Another name for the enemy is an adversary, one who opposes, one who resists. An angel of light. He's the master of deception. So it might look good, it might look like it is God, but that's why it's so important to have a relationship with Christ because he is a master at being an angel of light. He is the Antichrist, one who denies or opposes the word of God. He is also named Apollyon, which in the Greek means destroyer. He has come to wreak lies. He has come to wreak destruction. He has come to destroy. He is the master, I said, of deception. He is a deceiver. He will try to trick, ensnare, and take what is invalid and make it look like true. Mm. He will come to bring what is invalid and make it look like true. That's why it's so important to be in the word of God and to know the word of God for ourselves because we need to take the lie and bring it to the truth and the truth will dispel the lie of the enemy because what the enemy is trying to do, enemy means something that is harmful or deadly. He is trying to bring your faith to nothing. See, it's your faith that he's after. He's not after your body. He's not after your family. He's after your faith. Right, right. See, if he can get our faith, then he can destroy our faith in Christ. If he can get our faith, then he can wreak destruction. He is the God of this age. Corinthians 4.4. 4. The scripture says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe. Think about that. The God of this age has blinded those who do not believe. I remember when I first got saved, I said, are you telling me that my whole life before this was a lie? I was blinded to the truth. And he's doing the same thing today. He is the God of this age. But the rest of the scripture says, Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. That's 2 Corinthians 4. 4. He is the lawless one. He is the one without boundaries, with no restraint. He is unruly. He will try to get his people to live a life of no restraint, no boundaries. It doesn't matter who I hurt. It doesn't matter how who I step on to get ahead. It doesn't matter what I partake in. It doesn't matter what I do. I am unruly. I have no boundaries. It doesn't matter. He is a man of sin, the murderer, the power of darkness, the prince of the power of the air. He is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. See, Satan is not playing. The enemy isn't playing. We always talk about this at a little, little bit of sin, a little bit of leaven. Leaven's the whole lump. He's trying to ensnare you and get you to doubt God that he would devour you. Devour is a whole, and it's holy. He is playing for keeps. He is the ruler of this world. He is a tempter. So he will entice and he will bait us as Christians. He is the wicked one. But I love this scripture. If you want to put that up, Pastor Matt, it's Ephesians 6, 16. Ephesians 6, 16. Well, we can look at all these scriptures and there's a lot more if you ever want to look them up on who the enemy is. But I wanted to expose his character this morning. But it says in Ephesians 6, 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked.
wicked one. The shield of faith. Our faith in the blood of the Lamb. Our faith in Jesus Christ. When you have been come against by the lawless one, by the wicked one, by the one who is meant to bring destruction in your life. How do you shield your heart? You shield it by faith. How do you shield your family? You shield it by faith. Yeah. Faith in the blood of the lamb. See, it might not look like it changed yet, but God is in the changing business. He's in the delivering business. So keep the faith. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Keep because he is forming an exceeding way of glory inside the believer and inside his body right now. He will allow this enemy that I brought forward to you today to come against you to shape and change his people and to draw them closer to him. So where you find yourself is not your final stop. Where you find yourself this morning in life is not your final stop. Scripture says, and this is a familiar one again, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For thou is with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. I walk through the valley. You are going through the valley and it's just a shadow of death. The shadow is a liar. The shadow is not real. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thy anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. My cup runs over even in the midst of a trial. Put your praise hands on. Get up and begin to praise God in the spot that you find yourself in because you're not staying there. That's not your final stop. That's not your final destination. You are going through. See, and I said, fear is false evidence appearing real just like that shadow. That shadow was dark. That shadow had come to intimidate. That shadow had come to shake the faith of the believer. But the believer had to walk through yeah. the valley. It's a manipulator of your emotions. And that fear will manipulate you to get you to not believe your God and trust him. Right, right. But God wants to take you to another level. He wants to take you deeper than you could ever imagine. He wants to take his people to a place of unending victory, unending blessings, unending grace, unending peace, unending power, unending of his presence. Hallelujah. The enemy will try to discourage you from the process of moving forward through your circumstance or your situation. And sometimes the enemy will use your own heart and flesh and struggle to keep you believing that you're the same person. He will use our struggle and accuse us day and night to get us to believe that we are still that old person. But God said, therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. When you are born of a new nature, you are born of a new power source. You are born now of a divine nature. That very nature of sin that has kept you bound for so long. When you said yes to Jesus Christ. When the Egyptians came out of Egypt. When they came out of bondage. Pharaoh had no claim over their lives yeah. anymore. Yeah. And that's the same with us. When we give our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. That nature of sin is now broken. We are now filled with a divine nature, a new power source to be able to walk free from struggle and free from bondage. That doesn't mean that they're not going to be there, but that means that there is an overcoming power greater than ourselves that we can reach by faith. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. And I want to encourage you that through this trial, through this circumstance, through whatever situation you might find yourself in, you are not alone. Remember, I told you, he is a master at isolating his people and getting them to believe that they are the only ones. Well, Deuteronomy, I'm giving you a lot of scripture this morning. I warned Pastor Matt. 
I was trying to take after him. But Deuteronomy 31 verse 8 says, And the Lord, he, it, wait. And the Lord, he it is that does go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. So he will be with you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. That word fail means he does not slack on his promises. That he is not a God that he shall lie. And I actually gave this example um, on our Zoom meeting on Wednesday. And I'd like to use it again. And I love my father. My dad gave his life to the Lord right before he passed away with cancer. But he, when, before he got saved, it wasn't the greatest experience. And my dad would come and he would tell me, oh, baby girl, I'm going to come pick you up this weekend. And he wouldn't show up. And I would cry and I would cry because I wanted my dad. And, and then he would tell me again, baby girl, I'll be there this weekend. And he wouldn't show up. And, and it would happen over and over and over and over again. And it just instilled in me this place of he's not going to show up, of fear that he's not going to show up. And I kept thinking to myself, but the God that I serve isn't like my own natural father who I loved and adored. He was my knight in shining armor. But my God is not like that. He doesn't say, I'm going to show up and not show up. He's he, every promise that God makes to us, he will keep. He promised that he would keep it. And he has been faithful time and time again. See, he will not slack in his promises. That word forsake means he will not loosen, nor relinquish, nor permit. He will not forsake you. He will not loosen his grip on you. He will not relinquish control of you. And he will not permit the enemy to overtake you. He will not forsake you. Then he says, fear not. Be not be dismayed. That word dismayed means to break down by violence or confusion or fear. He said, don't be broken down. Yes. Don't be dismayed. Don't be broken down by violence, confusion, or fear. Hallelujah. And I feel like during this season of life, there's right. a lot of fear, there's a lot of confusion, and there's a life like a violent act that is going on right now. But he said, my child, be not dismayed, for I don't slack upon my promises. I won't relinquish control upon your life. I will not loosen my grip. Don't be broken down by the fear and the confusion, for I go before thee, and I will yes. be with thee. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, we need, look, I'm going through a lot of scripture because we need to stand upon yes. the word of God. We need the word of God to be rooted in our hearts this morning. For he is not the author of confusion, but the author of peace. Yes. And it says in all the churches and the saints. Yes. He wants to bring peace. He says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Right. It's yeah. not a temporal peace. It's not a wish-washy peace. It's not a peace that's there for a moment. It is a peace that surpasses all understanding that causes your circumstance maybe not to go away, but you shall excel above your circumstance, guarded by the peace of God. Your mind and your heart, and what is that peace in that verse? It says, do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let them be afraid, because that peace will be, bring a quietness, a rest, a stillness and a oneness. See, when we're one with Christ, see, when we were baptized in the Christ, he took us and placed us in Christ. 
We can be one with him. We can be still in him. We can hide under the shadow of his wings. He said his name is a strong tower and the righteous run in and they are safe. Mm. That word safe, it reminds me of, of a baseball field and I'm, I'm running the bases and I slide in and the umpire says safe. There's nothing else that the other team can do. There's nothing else that can be, be done. I'm safe by the umpire. Well, that word means that they run, they run in and that they are safe, that they are untouchable. We are untouchable. Wow. When we hide in the names of God, when we hide in the word of God, there is not anything that the enemy can do. So I want to remind you as you travel through this journey of life that he's going to get the glory. That your adversary has come to destroy your faith, but you are not alone. And what looks like defeat, or maybe even is defeat, is not your final destination. God will get the glory. Exodus 14, 13 says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of of the Lord, which he will show you today. Moses and the children of Israel had already faced a lot up until this point. And I was talking to a friend of mine this week and she said, Angela, I'm just tired. I'm just tired. I faced so much up until this point. I've gone through so much up until this point. But God wants to tell you to keep going, to keep going, but because there's so much more. Yeah. There's so much more that he has for us. He's so much more that he's greater than the trial that the children of Israel had faced up until this point. And God is looking for an opportunity to reveal his glory. He's looking for an opportunity to reveal his character. He's looking for the opportunity to use his people. And I want to point this out that right before they got to this verse in the beginning of Exodus, it says Exodus 1.12. But the more, listen to this, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. Hallelujah. The more that Pharaoh and the Egyptians had afflicted God's people, the more they multiplied and grew and they were grieved because the children of Israel that word afflict means to depress to press down to cause to sink to a lower position to lessen your strength to cause you to be discouraged to sadden to de decrease value and activity have you felt pressed down lately? <laughs> Have you felt like you were being, you were sinking? Have you felt like your position, see, the enemy would love to bring us to a lower position in Christ, but we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He will cause our strength to be less. He will cause us to be discouraged and sad. Hey, wait, I, look, can I get a witness, okay? There's times I wake up from my bed in the morning lately, and it's like a sadness has set in. But I'm like, oh, not today. Not today, not today. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to praise God. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to trust God. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to get into his word. But it's like as soon as I open up my eyes, it's like this sadness. I feel it when I walk into the grocery store. It's like this oppression that has set in, that has come to afflict and depress God's people. But it says the more that they were afflicted, the more that they multiplied and grew. What does that mean? There was an increase. There was abundance. They excelled and they enlarged. God's people are getting an increase. There is going to be an abundance of grace, of power, of his presence, of his victory. There's going to be a growth. He's enlarging our borders. He is causing us to excel in our situation. When God, when the enemy wanted to press us down, God is causing us to rise up. He's causing us to excel. Hallelujah. There's prosperity in the spirit 
right now. Yeah. There's prosperity yeah. in the spirit right now. God is causing his people to rise up, to multiply. See, yeah. so, souls are being saved and snatched out of hell right now. God is using it to cause us as a people to grow. But you know, sometimes when the enemy comes in like that, he gets even more angry. Yeah. And situations sometimes get worse before they get better. So Exodus 1.13 said, The Egyptians and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with vigor. Vigor meant to break into pieces and to crush. To break into pieces and to crush. This might, whatever you're facing, it doesn't even have to be with the corona. Because, you know, we were facing some things before that happened. And God has allowed some things in our hearts to come up while it's happening. And we're facing normal, everyday situation while it's happening. See, life is still going on, even in the midst of a natural national pandemic and the enemy will use that with vigor to break us into pieces and to cause us to be crushed but defeat is not our final destination defeat means to be beaten in battle to be overthrown we are not overthrown God is still in control God is still Christ still wears the crown of victory. There is still victory in the name of Jesus. So the enemy had tried to afflict them. He had tried to crush them. He had, but desperation always precedes deliverance. And me and Pastor Matt, we were talking about this this week. Well, during this week as I was preparing. And I was thinking about the children of Israel. And the, and the plagues that they faced. See, they were being afflicted. They were in bondage. They were being crushed. They were The enemy was trying to crush them. But not only did they have to go through all that, but then they had to go through the plagues with the Egyptians. See, they felt the affliction of what the plagues were causing. See, God's people are still walking through this virus, even though the hand of God is still upon us. Yeah. We're still feeling the consequences of what is going on in this nation. And this cry in their heart produces him to meet their need. See, and he, they walked through all of the plagues. But it was the blood of the lamb that yes. kept them. It was the blood of the lamb upon the doorpost that kept his people from death. Mm. It's the blood of the lamb. So maybe time and time again, I couldn't imagine walking through these plagues and watching them take place. I mean, the water was turned to blood. Mm. You would be affected by that. That's right. Mm. There was frogs everywhere. You would be affected by that. There was lice. You would be a locust and hail. You would be affected by that. There was death in the livestock. There would be a smell coming in the air from that. You would be affected. There was darkness set in. We, would, as God's people, would be affected by that. So I felt like time and time again, they probably felt defeated. Every time a plague came up, and every time Moses and Aaron would go back and say, let my people go. And he, they wouldn't let them go. How many times have we been to God and been asking him to do something, asking him to change something, asking him to move in our families, asking him to change the way we think or something that we've been going through or battling with? How many times have we been to him and, and, and felt defeated because it didn't happen? Because we didn't see it quite yet. But finally, when the blood of the Lamb was applied, when the blood of the Lamb was applied, that's when they finally were able to go free. And I want to encourage you today that apply the blood of the Lamb, apply it to your hearts, apply it to your circumstance, apply it to your situation, 
apply it to this nation, apply it to your jobs. I know a lot of us and some of you are on the front lines. Thank you. Thank you for still going to work. Thank you for still, I know it's not easy, but the blood of the lamb, the blood of the lamb when you go, oh, the blood of the lamb when you come, the blood of the lamb when you lay down, the blood of the lamb when you rise up, the blood of the lamb. Yes. It was the blood of the lamb that finally set them free. But you know, I, as many times as I look at this and I'm like, man, they were afflicted, they were being crushed, then they walked through the ten plagues. I mean, really get a picture that I'm trying to paint for you. They were constantly, it's like, it, ever been to the beach? I use this all the time because I love the beach. But every time you go in a wave and you stand up and there's another one right behind it and you get knocked down and you go back under, I feel like that's probably how they felt at that time. Right, right. One thing after another, after another, after another, I can't even get a breath from coming up before another, after another, after another. And what I like about this is it says that God, after the plagues, after they were set free, they were probably rejoicing. Have you ever been in that circumstance? You've been praying. You see God move. It's awesome. And God did it. And you're changed or the serve, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden it says God led them through the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. It, it, God didn't bring them into a mountaintop. <laughs> Think about that. God did not, after he delivered them out of Egypt, it said he led them to the wilderness. My God. And what was a wilderness? It was an uncultivated, uninhabited place. It was undisturbed. It was empty. It was pathless. They didn't even know the way. <coughs> There's no path. It was remote. There was wild growth going on. It says it's confusing in multitude or mass. And it was a bewildering situation. Have you ever felt bewildered? Like what in God's name is going on? How am I in this situation? How did I get here? What? God, I'm doing my best to follow you, Lord. I'm doing my best to believe you, God. And all this sudden you're in a circumstance that you don't even know which way to go you don't even I mean that's how this pandemic happened it was like it just showed up now I'm not going to get into all those details but it showed up and everybody doesn't know what to do where to go how to figure it out what's going on and God's people he's just saying trust me believe me have faith and be obedient he was teaching his people to be obedient to his word to trust him and to have faith in the wilderness yes. that he would know the way that he would make a way where there seemed to be no way that he would produce life it was uncultivated that means that there was no life in the wilderness he was about to produce life in the wilderness there was no path he was going to make a way in the wilderness there was death going on he was going to produce life in the wilderness it was dry in the wilderness he was going to produce water in the wilderness and it was bewildering so confusing he was going to bring peace in the wilderness mm. hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. fear not stand still and see the salvation of the lord the children of israel they followed that cloud by day and that fire by night. And this represents God's people trusting God, being led by his spirit. And they were still coming against the obstacles. And that's the gospel that we need to preach. Is that no matter, we're still as a people of God going to come up against obstacles. Oh, and as I was writing this out, I thought about this song. And it's called Through the Fire. And I've heard Joseph Larson sing it, but it's by the Crab family, I guess. And the words go like this. And I want you to, I wish I could sing. I would sing it for you. <laughs> but it says, he never promised that the cross would not get heavy. And the hill would not be hard to climb. He never promised victory without fighting. He said, help 
would always come in time. Just remember, when you're standing in the valley of decision and the adversary says, give in, just hold on. Oh Lord, he's going to show up and he will take you through the fire again. I know within myself, I would surely perish. If I trust the hand of God, he'll shield me from the flame again. See, he never promised that the cross would not get heavy. He never offered a victory without fighting. He never said the hill would not be hard to climb. But he said that help would always come in time. Amen. And remember when you're standing in the valley of decision and the adversary says give in, just Hold on. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Hold on to the word of God. And that's exactly what they needed to do when they were delivered and being led through the wilderness and up until the Red Sea. I was, when I was reading this, I was like, God, you couldn't give them a break? Like, there was no break. It was like, it was up against the next thing, against the next thing. And through the wilderness, they were on the bank of the Red Sea. And I just thought about this. They were going through unprecedented circumstance after circumstance after circumstance. And when it looked like it couldn't get any worse, here is the Red Sea. But God was about to work a miracle on the bank of the Red Sea. See, defeat was not their final destination. And the Red Sea wasn't even their final destination. They had to stand on the bank of the Red Sea and believe that God for the impossible. Thank you, Lord. But see, the enemy wasn't going to let them go easily. He wasn't going to let them cross over easily. And it says in the word of God that God said to Moses, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. See, God was in absolute control of what was about to happen because he was testing his people. Will they believe me? Will they believe me? But he was 100% aware of what was going on with his children. 50,000 horsemen, 200,000 footmen, and chariots were on their heels. I would think that that would be intimidating. I would think that it, they probably were anxious and fearful and felt shut in. And they probably were like, well, should we run back? What should we do? I, that's what they said. Should we go back to Egypt? It was better in Egypt. Well, let me say this, that going back is not an option for the child of God. Amen. And faith will always cause us to move forward and move through. See, Moses said, fear not. Standing in this impossible situation, I want to say what the word of Moses had said, what the word of God had said. God spoke to Moses and said, tell my people to fear not. 365 times in the Bible, don't fear. And what I love about God is, is he did that because why? Because he knew you were going to fear. He knew I was going to fear. He's not heaven going oh there she goes again fearing no he said my child I'm going to give you this promise again fear not fear not fear not and stand still sometimes you think that standing still means to give up well that's not what that means that means station yourself and continue to believe that the unseen hand of God is still moving Remind yourself of the victories he's already won. I can see the children of Israel going, he already delivered me out of Egypt. He already delivered me from the hand of Pharaoh. He already delivered us through the plagues. We already got through the wilderness. God is going to give us the victory over the Red Sea. He's going to do what he said he was going to do. Still doesn't mean do nothing. Still means fix your eyes on Jesus and continue to move through by faith. Believe and trust him.
him every step of the way. And the word of God says you will see the salvation of the Lord. It's going to appear before your very eyes. That thing you've been praying for, that circumstance you've been going through, God is going to fix it. God is going to fix it. God is going to fix it. He's going to fix it. He's going to do what we could not do. He's going to change what could not be changed. He's going to break the bondage that we could not break on our own. He's going to set us free. He's going to put your home back together. He's going to put your finances in order. He's going to heal your body. He's going to do what he said he was going to do. Because if you feel dead, if you feel dry, call on the name of Jesus. If you feel like it's been impossible, he's going to do it today. He said today was the day of salvation. He said fear not. Stand still. Don't run around like a crazy person trying to make it all work and fix everything. Just be still and listen for the voice of God to lead and guide and direct your life. And you will see it. And he's going to do it today. And I'm believing that this is a word for today that he declares over us as individuals. He declares over his people and he declares over the nation. I'm believing that God is, we're going to see it. We're going to see revival. We're going to see a move of God. We're going to see it like never before. Why? Because he set the stage for it to happen that way. God is setting up this stage. And he has the last word. He will accomplish what he said he was going to accomplish today. And I want to say this. It says in the word of God that the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see them again no more forever. That does not mean that whatever had been bothering us, whatever we've been going through, will never be before us Again, it means that it will have no power over you anymore. I know for myself, anxiety, I just put myself out there, is something that I struggle with. Struggle with being anxious and worrying a lot, which causes me to be heavy. That doesn't mean that anxiety isn't going to rise in my heart again, but God has already given me the victory over it. I know in whom I believe, and I know where my victory comes from, and literally, Little by little, he begins to deliver his people. He begins to set us free. And God wants to do that work today. It doesn't mean that it's not your circumstance is going to change immediately. But it means that he's going to give you victory in it. He's going to give you victory over it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says the Lord shall fight for you. Hold your peace. If you want God to fight for you, surrender. If you want God to fight for you, sit down. Because when we're fighting, God can't fight for us. But when we surrender and we relinquish full control over our lives, God can fight for you. And he said he will fight for you. Hold your peace. And he is peace. So hold on to the peace of God. Hold on to who he is. Hold on and don't let go. Jacob said, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm going to hold on to the peace of God and he shall fight for you. And most of us know the end of the story that Moses stretched forth his rod, which represents the cross. And Naya, if you would come up, I know you haven't been, but I would like to use you. (laughs) Hallelujah. Moses stretched forth his rod and the Red Sea opened up and the children of Israel walked through on dry ground and the enemy was upon their heels and even followed them into the Red Sea. But all of a sudden, as soon as they got to the other side, The sea closed up and the enemy was defeated. The enemy is defeated. And I want to encourage you this morning that whatever you have been facing, that defeat 
is not your final destination. That God has more for you as an individual and he has more for our church. And I don't mean just this church. I mean uh, the church as a whole. That there's more for the church and that there's more for this nation. I'm believing God to show his glory and that he's going to get the last word. So if we could stand this morning, I just want Naya to play a little bit and I'm going to pray. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we thank you. God, we thank you, Lord God, that as we worship you, closing out this day, God, that if we have felt defeated, that it is not our final destination, oh God. God, you have not called for your children to walk in an attitude of defeat, but you've called us to walk in an attitude of victory, oh God. God, change our focus, Lord Jesus. Let our eyes be set upon you. Let us stand still. Let us believe you. Let us rest in you. God, let us trust you, oh God, despite what it looks like, despite how we feel, despite what we even see in our natural eye, oh God, God, that we would trust you and believe you with our lives, Lord. God, because you gave your life. You gave your life, freely gave your life on Calvary in exchange for our lives. What the best exchange we ever made. Lord, and if there's those that are watching that do not know you, God, that want to know this God that we serve, that want to know a God that can bring them peace, that want to know a God that will provide and love them and won't relinquish control over them and won't forsake them and won't leave them discouraged and dismayed. God, I pray, Lord, you draw people to yourself, Lord God. God, and that they would surrender to you and they would know you, Lord God. God, and they would give their lives to you, Lord Jesus. God, and I pray for those of us that do know you, that you strengthen us in the battle, for the battle doesn't belong to us. The battle belongs to the Lord, oh God. God, you've already won. You've already seen the end. You've already seen the Red Sea open. You've already defeated the enemy. You've already done it, oh God. God, help us to stand on the bank of the Red Sea and look to Calvary, oh God, and watch you open the way to dry ground. Watch you defeat the enemy, God, that has been before Oh God, God, let us be a people of peace that hold on to our Prince of 